Let, let's see, I'll keep moving around with this. Um, so, hi, I'm Philip. Um, who has heard of OPA or Open Policy Agent before? Who has actively used it? Okay, that's far fewer. This is a more introductory talk anyway, um, so hopefully we are uh, meeting in the middle of that here. Um, so, a long time ago, I have tried to build things like this in Ansible where I was like I was configuring my service and at the end I tried to run a rule to figure out if I had done something stupid or bad. So basically I, I was checking like did I expose for example SSH um, to the world which I didn't intend on my server and I was running that at the end of my Ansible script um, to check if I had more or less correctly configured that. Who has done something similar like this? How much did you enjoy that? Or how well did you think that worked overall? Yeah, and um, that's what I, I thought. Um, so initially, it's kind of like, for starters, it's maybe better than nothing, but it wasn't really where I wanted to be. It's like, um, somehow it didn't feel right in terms of concerns, and also like it didn't run continuously, so it would only happen if I ran my Ansible script. If somebody changed something manually on the server, they would never detect that, so it was, it just didn't feel quite right. Um, but as with many things in security, we keep telling ourselves at first, this is fine and this works, right? Uh, and then we just wait until they are not fine anymore. But this is how we get started many times. Um, but what we really want is, we want to decouple the policy change from the control of the application, so that if I roll out my application, that's one step, but I want to potentially continuously run my checks against my application that I'm not exposing something or that I'm not configuring something that I don't want to have. Um, so you probably want to decouple that. A, to run them independently, but also potentially to keep them separate in terms of reviews and like I don't make a change in my Ansible script and I make a horrible change here that exposes something, but I also change the check in the same place and nobody notices. If you have it in two separate places and potentially different reviewers, there's a much higher chance that you will manage to figure out why you're off in one. And like I said, you probably want to run those constantly. If I, for example, SSH into the server to change something manually, which you probably should never do, but many of us still do on a more or less frequent basis when debugging something or when something is broken, um, that you still catch those then quickly enough and then not wait for another full Ansible deploy on that host to actually catch that we have broken something. Um, and you probably want to manage those things as code. So you can always test that manually, and we've also done that. Uh, it doesn't really scale, and it's also not like for the long term. Um, and you really want to get insight into the policy state. So that's why you overall want to have something like a static policy, that you can have that state of where am I in my setting in terms of security, and you can continuously audit those and store them. Um, and compliance and audits, the thing that everybody loves to have, right? Um, if somebody shows up for a compliance and, or audit, um, wouldn't it be great if you could just show them this is how we audit everything and how it's actually being checked, and you wouldn't have to just make up something on the spot then to pass the audit? because that's what often happens, that you build something just for the audit, but it's not really integrated into your processes and uh, how you work overall. So, why do we need OPA, or how can we make that better? Or why do we need better security in the first place? Um, this is one of the, the classics, I guess. I, I always say you have three types of security issues that you can run into. Um, you have the for your information, the WTF, and then you have the oh my god security issue. Um, and especially the oh my god security issues are the ones that you want to avoid, but maybe the other two as well. And the, the worst oh my god lab is normally you learn something bad happened to your infrastructure from the press or the public. Um, that's what you want, never want to have. Um, you could also see that somebody asked for ransom money. This is unfortunately also pretty common and I think there was something in Italy yesterday for example, uh, where that happened quite widespread. Um, in the lesser bad case, but still not great, you see it on your cloud provider's bill because somebody started to mine whatever cryptocurrency is fashionable right now, um, which is totally in inefficient on cloud infrastructure, but people still do it because it's your bill and not theirs. Um, you can prove it yourself after somebody broke in, 
you can still do that, that that's maybe helpful. Um, ideally, you can prove yourself that some security issue happened and you can prove that there was no harm. But what you really want to have, and that is where OPPO hopefully comes in, is that you can find the security issues before they really take hold in your system. Uh, because your policies constantly check, is something in the right state that I want to have it? Note that you can react immediately before anybody else tries to break into that. So that policies constantly run and you can catch stuff before the bad thing happens. Um, and the other thing that often plays into that is that security is often very much a tribal knowledge where somebody in the organization knew why you structured something in a specific way or why some access was set up in a specific way, but it was never put into a policy that somebody else could read and try to understand and then you would intentionally work on the policy to move you from another or to another secure state, but it's often very much just in the head of somebody what is the what is the implicit policy of what security should be in our system. Um, but tribal knowledge is not sustainable and as soon as somebody leaves the company or runs into a bus or whatever, it's gone. So we shouldn't rely on that. Um, so that's why oftentimes security is more like this, where everything is on fire and we are asking ourselves what the hell is our problem and how did we get here? And all of that, kind of we try to avoid uh, by not getting into that place where nobody knows why everything is just on fire anymore. Um, so we want to catch that stuff earlier. Cool. Obviously, there are no silver bullets. Um, if you talk to vendors, vendors will always sell you a silver bullet, but unfortunately you cannot buy it. Somebody will try to sell it to you, but you cannot buy it. Um, because security is always a multi-layered problem and has more than one final solution that you can buy. It's often more in the process and very application specific that needs to build into your application the right way. And OPA is one of those bullets that you might all have. It's not the one syllable one, but it's one of the tools that you can use um, to make your infrastructure more secure. So OPA is, I want to always say surprisingly little known because it started a long time ago, 2016, it's one of the CNCF uh, graduate projects by now, and it's quite widely used at big providers like Netflix and Cloudflare. And it's only one of a handful of CNCF graduate projects, so that's the list where we know many of those. Um, though some are a bit more obscure, and I always feel like Opera is a bit more on the obscure side here as well. Uh, unless, yeah, I mean, Spire and Huff and some others might be even less widely used or known, um, but OPA is definitely not on the, the top side of things um, of what you could do here. Um, okay, so from the, the OPA website, this is how they self-describe them uh, or self-describe with this comic image of what OPA is trying to cover and do for you. Um, so Regardless of what you run, and if it's Kubernetes or SSH, a UI, an API, or your CI CD server, all of those can be somehow run against an OPA policy, or an OPA policy runs against those and figures out what is going on, or you build it directly into your application. So you want to have these explicit policies of what is allowed or not allowed in your application. And that could be directly in the application, um, or often against the infrastructure. And since we're here on the content management side, um, it's maybe more on the infrastructure side that interests many of you, where you, for example, run it against your Kubernetes API to see if everything is compliant with what you're trying to do. Or if you're trying to run it against your S3 buckets to check that nobody has had a globally readable S3 bucket in your organization. Or that your APIs only allow certain access you might not want to put it so much in your, into the application, but I'll quickly show you how to put it into an application, for example, as well. Um, and what Opera generally does is um, you have a service, and the service runs a policy against or with Opera, um, and it gets back a uh, policy decision at the end. And how Opera actually figures out what is allowed and what is not allowed is it has a policy which is written in Regal, which I think they said they they try to imitate JavaScript to some degree, and for some people this is a feature, and for others it's a bug. And I, I have a feeling where we are in this crowd, 
Um, but you, you will notice that uh, Rego kind of looks like JavaScript when we look at it. And then you can also spin in data um, to have like, additional information that you might need. And in combination, those two can help offer make the decision, um, this is allowed or not allowed, or this is a compliance state or not a compliance state. So this is kind of like what OPA is giving you and how it's structured. Um, and to put that together, we are doing a very simple example here. We have an application and you can do a request against the API. And basically you want, with OPA, make a decision, can you access certain data? And the policy that we are having here is that this would only be allowed if we are running a GET request and against uh, the my data path and then the employee ID. And if the, the user that is doing the request has the same ID as you're providing. So let's say you logged into a system and you have ID three and you're then trying to get your data from my data slash three. Um, only then should it be allowed because only one user itself is allowed to access their own data. So that is the, the policy that you have. Um, and that is then the input how this would run, for example, here, it's not ID3, but for example, Philip. So the user that is logged in is Philip, and I want to access my data slash Philip. And only if this is, this here, these are the two same IDs, which is then matched in the policy. So this would be a request that is then passed as okay. And this way you can write all kinds of policies of what is the input that you're taking, and then the outcome if that is an allowed policy or not. Um, you could then make it one that fails. So here we add a default allow false, and it only is allowed if these IDs match. If I have another example where these IDs don't match, this would obviously be disallowed, and then uh, uh, OPA would uh, give you the result that this did not match and did not, what is not allowed. You can also make it a bit more complicated. Here I'm bringing in the data that is stored in memory, um, where I'm having like, I can access my data, but my manager can also access my data. So you need to bring in some hierarchy. And that is where the, the data comes in, because here in the data I have a list, or I need to provide an extra list of um, who is the manager of who. So Philip is the manager of Peter, and Kelly is the manager of Philip. Um, and then here, if I have the employee ID, and then I resolve the data manager of against this one here. Um, if this resolves correctly, then it will be allowed or not allowed. So it could be either a direct match just within the policy, or it could use this lookup basically against the data to make a policy de decision. That is, so policy in Rego and the data in JSON, um, those are the two main components that you have in, in OPA uh, to make policy decisions. And that's how you can build everything you want. Um, you can also use this against infrastructure, for example, like Kubernetes. So for example, here, um, we're importing a package Kubernetes. We import the future keywords. And then we only allow something if um, we have the resource uh, we're talking about is a pod here. And then we say the image must come from our own registry. So we were only running Docker images uh, coming from the elastic.co registry, no other registry is allowed here. So you could make sure that only your own registry can provide images and otherwise it's not allowed. And you can run all kinds of checks against Kubernetes, for example, whatever security related attributes you're running, um, if a specific label is applied to your containers, all of that can be expressed with Opera, since it can just query the, the Kubernetes API and then make a decision based on the, the data from the Kubernetes API against the policy, it can then give you an answer like this is allowed or this is not allowed. Um, maybe to make this a bit more um, visible. I bring my microphone. So what you can do is, um, there is play open policy agent.org. This is the playground. And you have a couple of examples that you can use here. And I'm just using one of these um, where I, I think I did the, the label existence uh, one. Uh, this is the one here. So basically, we say um, we, we check on the existence. And we require that my object has metadata labels cost center. And then the, the, so there must be a cost center label. And it also must uh, start with, so the value must start with cc code dash whatever. And um, only then 
this policy will pass. Um, and this here, so this is your policy. The input here is what you're getting from the Kubernetes API. So you're creating the API, and this is the result you're getting. And you can see here we have an object, metadata, name, my app. It doesn't have the label, so this will then fail, and then you have other specs like whatever Nginx and MySQL this is running. And then you can evaluate this, um, and then it tells me cost center is, if you don't, uh, if you highlight the wrong thing, it will not work. But here it says like every resource must have a cost center label, um, and only then will it work. So, how do we fix this one? What do I need to type? So we'll need uh, labels. We'll package an object into that. And then we say cost center. Let's try foo first. And then it says me now different error message because my disk rule passed now. Um, and now the second one with the cost center code fails because it must start with cost center code. And now if I change my cost center code foo, so if my Kubernetes API gave me that response, then it would say there's no reason to deny this, so this will pass. So this is how you could then check against the Kubernetes API, whatever is coming back here. Just as an example of what you can check, but whatever the Kubernetes API or any other API is giving you in terms of response, you could validate that against your policy and then make the decision if this passes or doesn't pass. Um, so far, so clear, any questions? Yes, please. I'll try to repeat. What is deny? What is deny? Uh, so, well, it, the deny tells you there is basically no reason to deny or there is nothing denying that rule. So this is like an okay state then, if there is no reason to deny it anymore. Uh, yes, please? Um, how do you implement the deny? I think this is the question. Uh, how do you implement the deny? Um, well, you, so Rego just gives you uh, the response and then in your application or in your logging system or whatever, you will then need to react to that. Yes, yes, sorry, so yeah, this is here, as it says, this is the output. So this is the, the outcome of this policy. And if I contain the input that this output variable is written, then it contains the message to this set of values. Yes, if my, if my cost center code was off, then it would say this is the rule why it was denied. So here I'm, I'm basically, the output here that I'm looking for and that my application then could take some action or my logging system would take or whatever, um, is basically looking, is there in my deny variable, um, is there anything that has basically offended my rules? Um, and then you can take a look at that, otherwise just continue and if there is nothing. And if you just put that into your logs or your application takes some automated action or whatever, it's really up to you. I think there was another question somewhere in the back. No? All good? Okay, cool. All right, move back. Um, here, another example um, that, that is very similar. Um, the, you will figure out after some time which packages are available. So here, for example, I'm using authorization and then I'm, I'm having a default, default allowed false again. So this, this one gives you not a list of, of offending rules, but basically the true or false back, depending if, if this is allowed or not. Uh, and here, I, I think I can only update my pet's information if I'm the owner of the, the pet. So here, the, the pet has an owner, and if that matches with the pet ID, then you can update your pet. Uh, but this is an example of how in your application you can make decisions um, if that is allowed. And you could use this rule either to make the decision within your application or you could also run something like this against the API continuously to check if you deployed something that suddenly breaks the rules that you're expecting. 
or you can let your application make the decisions through OPA itself as well. Um, uh, a very nice example that I saw from DoorDash uh, was that they have integrated that into their um, CI pipeline, uh, where they basically have then in GitHub, they have as one of the checks that they're running is that the, the OPA check failed, that you're basically, you try to roll out some infrastructure change um, that is not within your policies, and that you fail your pull request and you need to fix that first. So how that works, and th there is some DoorDash specifics uh, in there, um, so you, you start your Terraform pull request, uh, and then I think Atlantis is some DoorDash specific thing, but that generates the, the Terraform plan here, and it fetches the rules from um, OPA, from S3 where they're stored. It tries to execute the plan against OPA. OPA with the rules will give you an answer that this is allowed or not allowed, and then the, the result is being pushed back to GitHub, and then depending on the result, only if it passes, it will let you merge the pull request and apply it. Otherwise, you will need to add another commit, try to fix all of that steps before, those steps before. Uh, and once it's green, then you can actually apply the change and only then will you be able to roll it out. But that way you cannot, I don't know what they did here, but maybe they opened some port globally that they shouldn't. Um, that way you can validate your pull requests through offer rules before you merge them. So it actually catches any bad deployments before you actually roll them out. So this never, this breaking the security concept here never sees the production system or even development system uh, because you check it first. Um, I've already shown you the playopenpolicyagent.org where you can run those. Um, to run that and deploy, so either it's available, OPA is available as a Go library, so if you write your code in Go, you can just reuse the library, or you can use a daemon and run against that one uh, to make decisions. So if you write in a different programming language that cannot implement Go or use a Go library, you could just run it against the daemon to make those decisions, and then you just do a, a REST call against that, basically. Um, and why or how you should deploy those is generally, if you have a Go binary, you just can embed the, the library into your application. Otherwise, um, the official recommendation is to have it somewhere co-located, for example, in the same pod, if you need it very frequently. So if your application makes decisions based on OPA, if a specific API request should be allowed or denied, you don't want to have a normal network round trip uh, to make those decisions, but you want to co-locate the, the OPA container, you just query the local OPA container with the rules and make the decision and then allow or deny an API request, for example. Um, you could also maybe have it as a daemon set on the same Kubernetes node um, to just, again, keep the network latency low. What is generally not recommended is that you have it on some other Kubernetes node because then you might have a lot more, more network overhead. If you have more like continuous checking of your cloud infrastructure, this is probably acceptable. If you make application decisions when a user requests something, this is probably not great, or at least not how they would recommend it and want to run it. Um, so why do we at Elasticare, where I generally work? Um, so one of the fun examples that I've seen, that I quickly want to show you, is, um, and this is also part of the, the contribution, so Open Policy Agent Contrib has a couple of real world examples where you can um, see, for example, you try something without authorization. You have a MongoDB example. I've been talking about MongoDB before today, um, so if you feel like that, uh, it can also be do IP tables with Envoy and others. Um, but the example that I've picked here and I'm running is you can, based on the OPA policies, you can influence what data you would fetch from your data store, like Elasticsearch, for example. So I have set up that, um, I have done the setup um, already. I have compiled my policies. What I'm basically doing here is um, I have a very small Go binary. This is this is running with the Go library now. Um, so I'm running the, the Go library, and in my Go library, I am checking against the, the OPA SDK. I am making specific limitations of what is allowed and what is not allowed. And based on that, I will then run queries against my data store to fetch data. And OPA will basically limit what I will fetch from my data store uh, based on the OPA policies. Um, so it will then um, create an Elasticsearch query in this example. 
um, but limited based on what is allowed and what is not allowed um, from OPA itself. And it supports more or a couple of queries, so for example, a term query, um, it would then say what is allowed and not allowed here, but let me show you a practical example. So I am running my application here. This is running on port 8080. Um, I'm already running the, the OPA server uh, against which I can run my rules. And then I'm saying I'm Bob, and Bob wants to read all the posts. And then I'm just putting that out with JQ. And this is all the information I'm getting back. But in the background, the information that is being done is, um, this is the OPA query, and it defines what is allowed and what is not allowed. And based on that, <laughs> you will then trigger the right query in Elasticsearch to only say, like, based on the OPA rule, Bob is allowed to query for Bob. And then it will run this term query to fetch everything that has the author Bob um, as an example. And all the other queries here. Whatever condition we have expressed in OPA, we can then have that influence to run against my data store uh, to limit what information I can get, get back from that. Um, that made sense so far? More or less? Yeah, cool? Okay. Um, the other reason um, why we might care. Who has worked with CIS? Who enjoyed working with CIS? One person. <laughs> that's, that's the Stockholm Syndrome, right? <laughs> or did they pay very well? No, I, I, I'm joking. So CIS is basically an industry standard um, that gives you um, information of how uh, things should be configured to be secure or not secure. Um, they have like a hundred plus things they integrate into. So if it's a Tomcat server, if it's a Kubernetes infrastructure, if it's some AWS thing, there is probably a CIS uh, best practice of how it should be configured or how it shouldn't be configured. And then you have, I think you're getting a long Excel list that where you can check if it's configured like this or not. And what is uh, quite, or what, what a few vendors are nowadays doing, including us at Elastic, is that you can turn this into a product, or that you automate those CIS rules to run against your infrastructure, which is quite cool. Um, so we have something, we have, we've had beats for a long time, which is like file beat to get log files, etc. We have a new beat called cloud beat. So what cloud beat is doing is it's run against your APIs, um, and then runs an offer rule, so it it fetches an offer rule, runs it with CloudBeat against uh, your infrastructure, and then stores the result um, in, a, in a dashboard. Uh, so you can see how that works. Which, and all our rules are also public on, on GitHub, so we have cloud security posture. So here, this is where we turned our, or where we turned CIS into rego rules um, that we can run. And my colleagues have been swearing a lot to get to those rules, I must say. Um, but they, especially like expressing more complex things uh, in Rego is, or seems very painful. Uh, but this is kind of like the work that they turned out into that um, to figure out, I don't know, is something running with specific permissions or is root or whatever. And then you can run that against an infrastructure uh, and try it out. So what I'm doing here is I have in another tab here, this is based on CIS and runs against my Kubernetes cluster. And you can see there are a lot of rules configured and I have a couple of rules that I'm violating. Um, so for example, here in pod security, I could see, and I'll just pick a random one that will tell me, and you can see this is a CIS rule against Kubernetes um, and it says minimize uh, the admission of containers with net raw capability um, you can see the rationale. So this is all from CIS. It tells you why you should or shouldn't do something. Um, it, it has like basically all the metadata. And then it shows you the, the evidence uh, that this is what it query from the API and what is kind of offending the rule. You can also see the underlying rule um, that is being configured here and how it's then being put together. Um, the resource against which this was running, and then you can see the raw, raw JSON um, where it queried it out. So this is coming from the, uh, or this was queried from the Kubernetes API, um, and then it found that violation and all these other violations. 
So it basically productized to take these CIS rules, to turn them into a static set that you can run against your Kubernetes cluster, um, and then get these abbreviations. So one small side note, not all of these are run through OPA. A, a couple of those um, are also coming from eBPF. So with eBPF, we can instrument, uh, for example, how, how something is run on the command line. Um, so we can also figure out um, not just things from the API, but also from the host and how they are running on the host itself. But quite a few of those are also OPA, and this is kind of like the productized version of how we, how we tune OPA uh, if you don't want to write that yourself. Any questions so far or anybody good? Anybody still awake? <laughs> More or less, okay, cool. You've seen those. Um, to wrap it up, um, why don't you want to do all of this in your application? Or let's ask this one please. Who wants to do security rules directly in their application? Okay, since you're not application developers, uh, or many of you are probably more on the infrastructure side, um, it might be not so, so close to your heart, but I know that a lot of application developers are like, oh, I can write something in code, I will write everything in my own code. Um, and that's what I love, and that's how I get paid. Um, but you might want to decouple the implementation from the rules, just to have a second audit trail and also make it more explicit. Otherwise, it's very easy to miss something if you make a change that has impacts um, and why you don't want to merge all of that together. So you probably want to have something as explicit rules to run to check if that is allowed or not, which is probably also much easier to validate than your thousand lines of TypeScript or whatever somebody has been producing. Um, why you want to have it in change management is probably also, or why you don't want to have it in change management is also probably obvious, because if you don't run your change management every five minutes, um, you will not catch if somebody SSHs into a box and changes some configuration, and you generally probably want to decouple rolling stuff out and validating how security is being set up. And with a regular policy, you could just run that every X minutes or whatever against your infrastructure and see I'm still closing down my S3 buckets and ports and my certificates are valid and the users can only access certain parts of the API. All of that can then be decoupled and run from a central place and it can also cover both application and infrastructure in one security rule set. Um, why OPA is hopefully clear. Uh, OPA seems to be gaining more and more traction uh, as people learn about it even though it's not as widespread as people would think, though I don't think any other rule framework is really much more widespread than, than OPA right now, and it has the CMCI effect. Um, and with that, do we have any questions? Yes, please. So we try to build as well, and like you said, struggling with the regular policies or something like the CFC. Um, we try to do it for like a wash of the top 10 OWASP controls, and, and the better part of the month, we got really no Right, so I, to, to repeat the question for everybody, it's basically how do we, we avoid reinventing the wheel in rewriting everything in regular? Yeah, I, I, I don't know, I, I must admit, also coming from a vendor, I feel like this is where the vendor try to cash in or try to come in, that this is, this is a lot of work and hard work and it's not fun, um, as we've also experienced, and that's why it seems that a lot of these things are being more integrated into products than widely available rules. So there are rules on, like there are a lot of things on GitHub, so like the quality is also hit or miss, um, and, and yeah, you, you probably found most of those if you spend a month. Um, so there, there's a lot of stuff flying around, but how useful it is is, is a bit up for discussion. Um, I don't want to be too pessimistic, but I have the feeling that this is again, you have the standard, and everybody wants to build on the standard, but in the end, like the, the useful implementation is then often a vendor specific thing. I, I don't say that it has to be that way, or maybe we can find a better way, but I feel like just from a pure business perspective, this is how things are going to some degree. So I, I don't have a magic trick to 
say like here's this repository that has all the rules that will do everything for you, and then you're good. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm not convinced. Yes, please. So you you kind of recommended running it as a sidecar container in your vault instead of running it separately. So basically, back to your previous thought, it's not web scale, right? <laughs> Yeah, how do you scale it if you have a big application? So I think that the running it in the sidecar is really, if your application makes a decision constantly based on offer, then you want to have it co-located. Um, if you only want to test your infrastructure, like is something allowed or not allowed in my Kubernetes API, then I think you can run it wherever. Then, then I wouldn't care about the co-location. Um, the alternative would be, um, I think it was also as a demon set there. Um, so you mean, This one here. So, um, so you could run it as a daemon set once uh, on every Kubernetes node. So you don't have to have it in the same pod, but just once on the node. Uh, maybe that, that is the first step. Or you could have it maybe like this, but this is then the problem in terms of like, A, is this scalable? But also like, what about the latency? And yes, there is definitely an overhead if having offer as a, a standalone thing to run against. Um, or you could avoid that if you just write Go and package this in your binary as a library. Um, I think in terms of scale, this is probably the, the easiest one because then it's just built in. This has kind of like nicer separation of concerns maybe or it's not as coupled. Um, but that is then really up to you of how you write your applications. Sorry? But you were not asking about Go or Rust, I guess. No, I was, I was just wondering if you could use it for, uh, for example, for risk rules or whatever, where you actually want to decouple the rules from the application. You want someone to manage the rules and someone else to deploy applications and do things. Right. Um, if your latency allows it, maybe you want to run a dedicated cluster then for your rule management. I, I, I think you can go very wild and whatever makes sense. Uh, I think it's just a matter of trade-offs, as always. Yes, please. I think for that part for us has not been so heavy, I must say. Um, we have in our, so we have some Python bench, or we have some benchmarking actually in one of our repositories. Um, so here we are, we have some, some benchmarking infrastructure, so I think, was it in dev? Uh, so here we basically have, we, we wrote our own stuff to actually run this with benchmarks. Um, but, so both for correctness and performance, I think. Um, but that was not a main hurdle. So we, I, I, don't, I haven't heard any complaints about the, the performance of offer yet here. Though we don't have so many rules either. So if you have a lot of developers and you develop 10,000 rules that you run every minute, it might be a bit of a different thing, but if you have something that, for example, here it only runs against the, the eight infrastructure, then it was pretty fine, and I haven't seen any major concerns about that. Is there a list of the three compiler and the Lego read through all this? And it's not the same, but it has a copy of the bundle, so you must store all the things down the bottom in the group. But also, I have a non it's not that much. Yeah, I think the performance is not as much of a problem as writing the rules. I mean, I put my policies in there. I mean, files and all that work in all other ways. Uh, yes, please. Do you, do you run uh, Lego against Kubernetes retrospectively, or do you run it as a, a nationwide look? Mm, no, we, 
So we run it against the live API, if I'm not mistaken. So we, uh, that's why we have this cloud feed. So basically the cloud feed has the, the regular rule and then it just runs against the, the Kubernetes API. That's what the Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you could have it both ways, but the way we, we, for example, do it is we just run it live against the API. Cool. Thanks a lot for joining. I hope everybody learned something. Happy regular week.